Hi, so this is in response to some of the comments we've been getting about the swag and the effect of polling on the swag. Now, I have a bit of a habit of putting things a certain way. It's just my style, it's just the way I put things. You know the kind of thing, oh, we'll put a bit of this, we'll put a bit of that, we'll give it a go and see what happens. So it seems a little ad hoc. In fact, it isn't. There's a whole thought process that goes on behind that. And then when I come to do this sort of video or demonstration, I talk about it in that way because that's just my style. But there is a process going on. And if you want to understand or get some grip on the kind of ideas that we're talking about, you have to think about those back processes as well. So let's look at this swag and see what we think might be happening there. Now, we know that graphite and graphene is diamagnetic. That is, it has a response to a magnetic field. We know what a diamagnetic response is. So if we put a piece of graphite or graphene in a magnetic field, something is going to happen. Now, my idea was that that something would be a lineup, and it certainly seems to be right. So on the original swag, we had our plates with our two electrodes, and we basically dumped the whole thing on there. and got a lot of randomly oriented particles. Now we know that the salt water passing over the graphene is going to generate electricity. And it's no great difficulty to see that if it does that, in order to get to the electrodes, if it's random, it has to take a long path to get there. Now, graphene is not that conductive. It's conductive across the little bit of graphene that you've got. But in order to get to the electrode, it has to jump the graphene to graphene junction. And if there's a lot of them, the resistance is actually quite high. So getting that out of there with a random pathway like this takes a lot of energy. It's quite simple that if we were able to give it a direct path, the amount of energy required to get that power out of there is very much less. So how can we, at nanoscale, why are these two electrodes essentially to each other? That's quite difficult to do because it's so small. You can't get a little bit of knitting needle in a microscope and line them up. You can't do that. So if we look at the magnetic field as a possibility of aligning them like that, then we're going to get lots of direct paths. Nothing mystical about it. It's not difficult. It's just simply a wiring job. If you get a huge coil of wire and you wire up point A and point B with this coil, you're going to get a lot of resistance. If you just snip off the little bit that you need to go between the two points, you're going to get no resistance. It's the same thing. Just applying the field means that the diamagnetic property of the graphene has allowed it to spin round and rotate. Now, it does something else as well. It seems to gather up. It might be repelling it out, but we're getting gathering along these lines, which is why you could see the striations. So we get a little bit of gathering, a little bit of lining up, and when the whole thing dries, it sinks back down again. So effectively, we're wiring it up as straight as we can get it, and therefore, we're reducing the resistance between the two electrodes. So when we put the salt water over it, that path is so much shorter, we get such a huge increase in what's going on. And now, all of that makes a lot of sense when you think about the properties of the graphene, what we're actually doing to it, what we want to achieve. Those are the background thoughts. Now, there's nothing mystical going on here. It's not a, the pattern that it's forming. It's just simply, we're wiring together directly instead of having that tortuous path that they previously had to go through. That's it. Now, the shortest distance, if we believe in Euclidean geometry, between two points on a flat plane is a straight line. So it wouldn't get an improvement if we start doing patterns on it. If we get something like that, it may do other interesting things, who knows, but it certainly wouldn't conduct any better because the path is longer. It's not that difficult. All we're trying to do is a straight line between A and B, so we reduce the resistance so we get better um, ability to pull out the power that we want to pull out. So that's it. Now it works because graphite and graphene is diamagnetic. Amorphous carbon isn't. So if we get some ordinary old carbon, grind it up, chuck it on, and set it in a magnet magnetic field, then absolutely nothing will happen. Nothing will happen because the carbon isn't uh, responsive to a magnetic field. So there's no point in performing that experiment. 
I mean, you can perform it if you want to, to kind of have a look and see, just to prove that nothing will happen, but there's a very, very high likelihood that just nothing is going to happen. So let's have a better look at that magnetic field. Now, the magnetic field is actually generated by this thing. Uh, and this is a printer's compositing block. It's actually made from a Dana machine and it's given to me by a printer friend of mine. And these lines are um, sets of magnets that set up a magnetic field here. Now, the lines are quite fine, so it's actually called a fine pole um, device. But it's based on something called a magnetic chuck. A magnetic chuck looks a bit like this. where we have a series of magnets separated by a series of steel. The flux tries to take, the sh like anything, a magnetic flux tries to take the path of least resistance. The steel is permeable to magnetism, so it would prefer to go in thin the steel. But because there's nothing here, the field comes out like that. And that's how that field runs. Unless we put something on top if we put something on top of it that bridges that. So we have a piece of steel like that. The field will want to run in the piece of steel because that's the path of least resistance. So the flux path goes through the steel and nothing appears at the top here. And the same thing happens along. So we put a spacer. Brass normally. Steel, spacer, steel, spacer, steel. The field will be completely hidden within that device. A magnetic chuck works because this top plate slides backwards and forwards. If we slide that across so the brass spacer over here is over here, so we have this kind of arrangement, steel, spacer, steel, spacer, steel. The field now will want to get to this south, so we'll come back out again. So sliding this backwards and forwards moves that magnetic field within and without that sliding block on the top. And that's how magnetic chucks work. Now, that device we actually used was an arrangement of permanent magnets, just like that. It doesn't have the magnetic chuck slider bit on top of it, but that's the only difference between the two. What that means is that the field is permanently above the surface in that arrangement. So we have the north, south, north, south, and so on. So the field direction from north to south is in that direction. Now let's say we get a lump of graphene. Now, graphene is pretty much random. It's going to be sort of that kind of shape. Or it might be circular. It could be any shape at all. But the fact is, that will try to rotate itself within the field to get the path of least resistance. So if I bone that bit of graphite with the pointy end facing out towards the board, then it'll set up a diamagnetic field where it tries to get out of the field. Diamagnetism is where you apply a magnetic force to something and it creates within itself an equal and opposite force. So it's like trying to put two repelling magnets together. They'll try and get away from each other. And it will do that by rotating to the position of least resistance. So it will rotate so it's out of the board. Now, all of the graphene will do that, and it will line up. It will also try to get out of the field, so it will move to here, this low dip section here. So it's going to do two things. One, it's going to rotate from a random direction to line up, so they're all lined up. Two, it's going to be shoved into the little piece in between them, like that, and you'll get a build-up in that area. Now, remember we saw the striations quite clearly, and that was because there was a thicker bit here and a thinner bit here, and that's what's happening. So the graphene's lining up and being pushed out to form thicker, slightly thicker wires, if you like, graphene wires, all in line with those pole pieces. So the actual thing itself was like that, with the field direction in that direction. The graphene then fills these spaces in between, rotates 90 degrees to the field, so we get lines of graphene between them. And we see those slightly thicker, slightly thinner lines. 
And that's what's happening there, or at least that's what I think is what's happening there. Now, an obvious improvement to that is to make an even finer pole device. We have a fine pole device. We need to have a finer pole device. Now, it wouldn't help putting it in a solenoid. And if you think about it, you'll see why it wouldn't help putting it in a solenoid. It wouldn't help putting it in a solenoid because a solenoid creates an even field. What we want is an uneven field. So we need a fine pole device, as fine as we can get that device, with this kind of field shape to it, going from north to south, north to south, so that we can get this kind of lining up, and if we can make it narrower and narrower, then we should get a better response out of it. So in terms of manipulating the field, that's probably the kind of thing that you need to be looking at. Now, of course it's interesting to look at these things for other reasons, in terms of a solenoid, or in, uh, in terms of magnetic field shapes, and so on and so on. But remember, we have an objective. So looking at this in terms of the swag, I would suggest that that's the kind of thing we need to be looking at. And that's the kind of background thoughts that go on with that, hey, let's chuck that here and chuck that there. There's a process behind that, that when you're looking at these things, you need to think about the processes behind as well that have been thought about when you start to think about it yourself moving forward. Because if you don't grasp that, then some of the suggestions and some of the work that you're going to want to do are going to be off kilter. You have to start thinking about what processes are being done there, what properties do they have, what do we want to achieve. When you get those in line, then you'll move forward on something. Now, the magnetic field stitching the whole thing together is the uh, exact effect that I wanted. And you have to remember that what we're trying to produce here is a machine that is essentially cheap, easy. Anybody can do it, and it can be put anywhere where you're going to get a variable amount of salt water. Any coastline, and there's a lot of coastline. So that's what we're actually looking for. Now, there have been suggestions to bang a magnetic field behind it. If you bang a magnetic field behind it, you've got two options. Either you're going to put an, uh, a current through there, you're going to wind it up on uh, a coil, you're going to put a, some kind of solenoid arrangement behind it, or you're going to whack some big old N50 magnets behind it, or something like that to create a magnetic field that will interfere with those lines. Now, something interesting could happen there, that's distinctly possible, but it also defeats the objective machine. The machine, remember, has to be cheap, it has to be reproducible, it has to be easy to do, we have to be able to make it as big as we possibly can. If we start putting magnetic fields in such a machine, we're going to make it prohibitively expensive. Now, it might be a way to go for something else, sure, but it's probably not a way to go for the swag generator. So you need to, as well, when you're thinking about developing the swag generator, have those thoughts in mind as well. What kind of use will it have? What kind of cost is going to be involved? If you make the thing too complicated and too costly, a very, very, very good chance it will never work, and it will, even if it does, it will never be adopted, because it's just too complicated. Anything that you make more complicated is bound to have a higher degree of failure. There's more likelihood of something failing the more complicated bits it has working in there. So if you want to think about the swag, and I think a lot of people do want to think about the swag, you need to think about those things. So just to sum up, you need to think about what we're actually trying to achieve. What kind of properties the materials actually have? What's the best way of improving upon those properties? You also need to think about the cost of the final machine and its implementation. It's not something that's a random look at, really. We have a specific objective. We want to produce a machine that's cheap and easy to reproduce. So creating structures around it that are um, expensive and complicated is going to doom it to failure. You probably don't want to do that. Anyway, I thought I'd put these down in a video for you so it would help with some of the thought processes that you have on this. And I hope it was of interest to you, and thank you very much for watching.